Hello, everyone. Thanks for those that have, have just joined. We've given people a, a couple of minutes, so we'll, uh, we'll make a start now on the hour. Um, so welcome to Blocks Breakfast Club. Um, today's topic, and I don't know whether you'll be joining us on Thursday as well, but today's topic is collaboration. Um, we've got a, a number of speakers to get through, um, so we'll just do a few introductions to start off with. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, my name's Dan Whiston. I'm the Director of Digital Transformation at Block. Um, I've been here about two years, 20 years within healthcare in total, um, mixed between both NHS roles specifically and commercial. And the last role of that was as a, as a director of IT and director of transformation for a large trust in, in the West Midlands. Um, I'll be talking to you today around more of kind of Block's broader COVID response and what we're doing there and some of the pieces that we're pretty, pretty proud of for sort of five, 10 minutes. I'll then hand over to Sean Pell, who's our collaboration practice lead at Block, who will go through looking at kind of the, the challenges and opportunity and use cases there are within collaboration, specifically obviously looking at COVID, um, looking at it from the perspective of kind of that, that integration and what's being done around N365 and how N365 can be leveraged by you guys. And then Rodri, who's a systems architect at Cisco, will then look more specifically at the technology and the integration that's going on between Microsoft and Cisco at the moment, looking at how they can start to leverage that and how you guys can start to, to take that opportunity to, to improve the user experience that, that your staff and colleagues have got. Okay, so I'll start with sort of 10 minutes on uh, what we're doing with regards to, to the COVID response. So Sean, if you can go to, to the next slide. So there's four kind of areas I thought I'd briefly cover to give you a, a, a broader view of, of Block and what we've been up to for the last five months. So first is around NHS Nightingale Hospitals. Back in end of March time it was, um, our CEO and owner and founder, Mark Chang, got a call from Sarah Jensen at Barts. Um, as they were asked to stand up the first of the Nightingale Hospitals at Excel, uh, which was something that clearly we were, were very, very happy to do. And sort of within hours, in fact, I think by the end of the day, we had a, a truck at Excel with kit on. Um, but with hours, we had a, a kind of team st stood up. And it was a very intensive piece of work that was done then. So we were working with numerous, numerous stakeholders within that piece of work. The, the army, obviously BART staff, architects, engineers, tradesmen, uh, to stand up. The, the hospital, obviously, from our side, the, the IT infrastructure piece, um, within about a week. And clearly, we were on site past that. But, but really, the, the main piece of that work happened within a week, which was a, a significant piece of work. Uh, after that, we then carried out, of the other eight, we carried out another two of those. So Yorkshire and the Humber, we worked on a number of weeks after that, and then North Bristol as well, both of, of which were, I guess, slightly smaller in size and scale, but nonetheless kind of complex. There were lots of work that went on there. In total, I think there were sort of 12, 1,200 switches went in, 1,700 IP phones, over 700 access points. I think in total, Sarah Jensen has been quoted as saying we had 26 kilom kilometres of of cable, so ma massive amounts of work and lots of complexity as well, not just in terms of putting that network in, but looking at connection and, and integration of all the medical equipment, CT scanners, looking at kind of vi video, video consultation capability, all of the Wi-Fi enabled sensors. So significant work that was done to get that set up and, and very much, I think, Block were proud for many, many reasons. One of those was the, the responsiveness, but also the collaboration that we worked with them on. So all of those customers are, are kind of customers we work with. Barts is a very long standing customer, but it really was a group effort and, and you know standing shoulder to shoulder with the NHS in terms of doing that. I put a couple of pictures in. So Sean, if you go to the next, just to, just to um, give you a view of this, because I thought they were quite interesting purely in terms of the scale. So you can see there on the right hand side, uh, one of the halls within Excel uh, before the work started, I guess two things. One, the, the pure size of the hall itself, but also kind of the, just the immense nature of how many people were involved in that process. And obviously, as I've kind of gone through, the, the, the significant amount of kit and equipment that was involved in the process, you know, logistically a massive, massive piece of work. And as many of you will know in terms of kind of that, that type of work starting from scratch would take a, an NHS trust working with a supplier probably a year, if not more, to do. So to do it in a, in a week shows what can be done uh, under those sorts of circumstances. And then, Sean, if you go to the, the next slide. And then, I guess, moving to kind of the, the finished product, if you like, and luckily, from certainly what we understand and what we see in, in the, the, the media and from feedback, uh, you know, for all of us, very lucky that none of these hospitals are being used to anywhere near the capacity, or if at all. But you can see there a, a finished state of both a ward within Excel 
and also a, a, a kind of a bed bay, which I think hits hits home to all of us at Block because we are so passionate about working in healthcare of what it's all about that you know ultimately that's there to to save someone's life and to enable the clinicians to do the job that they need to do. So that's the the kind of the first area that we've worked on, and the second is looking at kind of remote access from a from a clinician point of view. So we did a, a number of pieces of work once uh, COVID hit around our primary care desktop solution. And again, as, as COVID hit, we had numerous phone calls, as I'm sure many, many suppliers did to support. And this was really around how we could start to really extend very, very rapidly the capacity of that primary care desktop. So we worked with the likes of Birmingham and Solihull CCG, Telford and Rekin and Barts. Uh, Birmingham, I think we put a, an additional 1,000 users on uh, from Telford and Rekin. It was moved from, six, from 150 to 650 and Barts who are our biggest customer in terms of that desktop solution, moved from sort of 12,000 and added another 2,000. And, and you know, what that gave, those are just numbers, but what it, what it gave and what, what's so critical to that during this period is it, it gave these organisations the opportunity to very quickly work flexibly and be fleet of foot so that they could start delivering care, they could start delivering you know, clinical care externally and remotely from people's homes, but equally that the, the, the normal piece around how you manage a primary care organisation or an acute trust, they could start delivering corporate services so that all those support staff could actually work remotely if it was needed, which again, um, big bit of work. And I think, you know, again, very proud of that we were that we were involved and asked to support our people within that. Then the final two before I hand over uh, from a from a WebEx point of view, which obviously we'll, we'll get onto far more detail around collaboration in a minute. but. Um, Lots of, lots of requests as that happened in terms of leveraging kind of WebEx trials and how we could start ramping that up. So Sean and the team and Kev who's in the, the room with me as well were involved with, I think it was a total of eight trusts that we worked with to enable over 5,000 users in terms of giving them the ability to work with WebEx. And that was looking at synchronization of Active Directory and giving that enablement. I, I'm sure not all of those staff were necessarily using it, but again, what it gave the NHS with those trusts, and we had organizations like Sheffield Teaching, Oxford University Hospital, Nottingham University Hospital, that opportunity to start to work flexibly at a time when then that flexibility was absolutely critical to them continuing services and having continuity and providing care for the, for the patients out there. And then the final area that I'll talk about, rather than you know those three being highly, highly operational uh, at that moment in time, is one that we're working on at the moment, which is far more of a de developmental piece, which is a, a product we're developing called Acellus, which is a a virtual patient consultation solution and we started developing that probably about nine months ago now obviously covid then hit but we've been working very very closely with a number of trusts you know very particularly uhdw in the development of that and that's about developing that provides more of a consistent approach to uh, patient clinician and enablement in terms of virtual patient consultation and looking very focused on the uh, administration of that and how you start to drive effective, efficient ways of working that fits properly into to, to the way that hospitals and primary care trusts work. And the reason CCGs work, the reason that that was so important to us is because, you know, although this is a period of, of heightened anxiety, heightened responsiveness, we believe that, that this way of working will, although a term used a lot at the moment, become the new normal. And we're, we're very keen that we continue to develop that product and are actively doing so to, to move forward and to be able to support the NHS. So hopefully that gives you a, a broad view, uh, as briefly as possible, as to, to the other things we're working on. We'll now move on to the, the piece around what, uh, what I guess you guys are here for in terms of uh, collaboration. Sean will first talk around uh, Block's approach to this, Block's perspective of it and some of the use cases and then as I say he'll hand on to Rodri uh, to look at the specifics of how Microsoft and Cisco are working together. Then we'll have a bit of an opportunity hopefully the last sort of 10-15 minutes if you guys have got any questions coming in and we'll hopefully be able to answer some of those for you. So over to, over to you Sean. Cool, thank you Dan. So yeah, I guess really what I wanted to go through on the first few slides was to look at the, I guess, the, the changes within healthcare and the, the different demands that have been put on from uh, from obviously COVID-19. And I think particularly what we've seen in terms of, like Dan's talked about that acceleration of technology deployment, is that we've actually seen ways of work and change in sort of months rather than years. And it's, it's really sort of accelerated the adoption of the technology. I guess what has been provided obviously through, through both Cisco and Microsoft is that actually um, partly through the WebEx deployments and the way that we've worked with projects, but also through that Microsoft uh, 365 and the, the M365 licensing agreement, 
has allowed sort of healthcare organisations to really take advantage of the, the Microsoft Teams product. And I guess what, what obviously we're looking to talk you through is actually how that integrates with the, the, the rest of the collaboration and state and how you can start to leverage both both vendors' technology stacks to, 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 to drive these changes within healthcare. And the first thing that I was going to talk through really was flexible working. And I think obviously flexible working is something that's affected every organisation across the world um, over the past six months. And I think particularly within healthcare, we've seen a number of roles which would normally have been done in a central location have started to be done remotely. And I guess the, the collaboration technology underpins a lot of them changes. I think what, what, what obviously we, we see and what, what needs to be developed is that, that experience and workflows need to be an integ integral part and consideration of them changes. And I think probably what, I guess, resonates with, with, I guess, probably a number of people on this call is that actually, I guess, a number of them changes have been, uh, been, been provided through the Microsoft Teams stack. But when people come into the office or when people want to talk to people that are, are in, the, in the trust, then, then have them two, two areas still communicate, so people that are remote and people that are still on site. And I'm sure we've all been in situations that we've come into a meeting room and that, that meeting room is leveraged, leveraged a Cisco estate that, that, that provides all them critical services, but that still has a requirement to join on to the Microsoft meeting services that, that, that people are using um, remotely. I guess tying in with that flexible working piece, I think we, we then have... Uh, I've been speaking to a number of trusts about space, space rationalisation. I think that, that comes into two components. Firstly, I guess, where, where we talk about flexing, flexible working and people working remotely, that then means, I guess, the estates can be consolidated and even where people were looking at what their strategy was going to be moving forward in terms of either relocating or, or uh, providing expansion to be able to, to facilitate them additional clinical services is actually reallocating people to, to have that ability to work remotely then means that their spaces can be used for clinical space and there's, there's less investment that needs to be done in terms of, of, of the, 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 the estate and location. I think the, the other part to it, what we're working with trusts on, is that actually, what does that mean from a data centre point of view? We all know, so I guess, there's, there's been significant changes over the past decade in terms of virtualization that has mean that, da that data centre footprint can shrink and obviously the, 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 the space, the environmentals, the, the, the power consumption can be reduced. But also I think now there's a, there's, a, there's a transition of looking around, certainly around collaboration and obviously the other technology sets about what can be consumed from a cloud service. So, but I guess when, when we look at that shift to cloud services, obviously both, both Cisco and Microsoft have that integrated offering. And what, what needs to be considered, certainly when we're looking at healthcare, and certainly within them acute trust, is actually what, how, how can them critical and, I guess, clinically integrated collaboration services still be underpinned by that technology? And how can that technology, that, that cloud-delivered technology, still provide, I guess, like red phones and then resilient services? And obviously, a core component of any acute collaboration uh, service is is that critical red phone service where they, they cannot go down and th there needs to be a, obviously 100% availability there uh, from any sort of one outages and isolated power outages or, or data center and complete, complete outages then red phones still need to work. Obviously as Dan said we've been developing that, that remote patient scenario but I guess where we talk about flexible working and uh, consultants and clinical staff working remotely then there's also a requirement for, for patients to not have to go to a central location to get advice and treatment. And, and, and really that's looking at how that collaboration estate underpins that. And that, that can be underpinned through, I guess, a number of different uh, software overlays and the, um, and the technology stack can be integrated within, within Cisco and, and Microsoft again. Uh, but, but fundamentally to that, obviously, the, the, the simple, simple to use and I guess the, the, the plug-in list technology uh, can provide that service. And I think a really, a, a really interesting one for myself is actually how, how we can enable people to work safer when they go into them central locations. I know I guess a, a lot of people focus on that meeting room environment, so I guess like alerts on capacity, alerts on, on cleaning, um, and, and a low touch experience which, which can be facilitated by the, the meeting room technology. I think what, what we're also working with customers on is actually 
how how we we work in them different clinical settings to prevent people from having to move around the different locations so much. So actually, when we talk about ICU wards and people having to go in and out of them, then how do we reduce that? And actually, can we that can be reduced by I guess utilizing video technology, make sure that patient records can be monitored, etc., from outside of that uh, that location, and and then providing that audio communication so that advice can be sought and given from outside of the, the outside of the ICU ward. I guess what, what that fundamentally means is that one, there's, there's, there's less risk to the patients and to the staff of, um, of also, I guess, if we talk about COVID-19, but the transmission of that. And then there's also time savings and people having to, uh, I guess, uh, get equipped into PPE uh, and then not having to, 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 to remove that afterwards. So I think there's, there's, there's a lot can be done in terms of safer working and how, uh, how people not only collaborate, but how their clinical functions work within, within the uh, acute trust. I guess overlay to all of that and overlay to all them changes and services is actually, it's not, it's not just, can't be taken in the isolation of, of them specific circumstances, but they need to be worked into the workflows. So how do people work and how does it change that? And how do the processes then get adjusted so that the collaboration technology is, is fully adopted? How do we make sure that we understand the experience so that from, from a, a staff point of view and from a patient point of view, that we can actually, one, monitor the, the uptake of it, the usage of it, but also monitor the experience and make sure it's a good and consistent quality. And then fully wrapping all of that within a guaranteed service. So that, I guess, when, when we talk about a guaranteed service, we talk about, I guess, it being modern and evergreen so that it's, it's continually updated, continually monitored, and we, we make sure that that is fully, uh, I guess, a customer success overlay. We make sure it's fast and performant, so that services, I guess, uh, focused on, on healthcare, and we make sure that it, it is developed and it, it performs in the way that it needs to. We make sure it's secure, it's compliant against sort of care cert and, and DSBT toolkits. We make sure it's governance, um, against 27,001, um, so it's obviously it's secure in all the ways it needs to be, and then we also make sure it's always on, so it's available, it's got guaranteed performance, and you've got that 24 by 7 service assurance, um, managed service overlay. I guess we've, we've, we've talked through the, the business, uh, obviously, changes to, to healthcare, but actually how can the, the, the collaboration technology facilitate them changes? Obviously, uh, like Dan said, Roger is going to talk through some of them, them integration points and, and the experience of that. But fundamentally, what we've seen is obviously, I guess, a, a rapid deployment of collaboration technology, whether that be Cisco or, or Microsoft Teams. And, and we need to make sure that when, I guess, we consider that from a remote setting or a setting that uh, is, is, is on site within, within the trust, that actually them services are providing the required, um, required collaboration facilities to the different users and that actually they're fully integrated so like I said before I'm sure we've been in that uh, meeting room that can't join a Microsoft meeting and I'm sure we've been uh, sat on it obviously that that critical voice element that's provided from Cisco but you need to be able to call someone remotely so integrating them services is key I think mean, what what is also key is making sure that the um, that whether it's on-premise deployed collaboration, voice and switchboard and contact sensor technology, or it's deployed in, in sort of Cisco Cloud, UCM technology, that it does still provide that fully resilient service. Um, so when we are talking about red phones, the, the critical, the, the SIP integrations, that actually the technology still facilitates all that requirements, which when we talk about a multi-tenant cloud solution, doesn't, doesn't always provide them services. So you, you, when, when you take into UCM Cloud, you can, you can procure all them services and, and use them services in the cloud, but you can also fail back to an on-premise call manager node um, if, if required. And that, that, can then, so that, that can then provide them critical service in the time of outages. I think, um, obviously, with, with, with the move to, to MS Teams within healthcare, there's obviously, there's, there's, I guess, two flavours with that that needs to be mindful of. One is, I guess, well, I guess part of it is a central uh, tenant, and then part of it is the customers using their own tenant. I guess when we talk about the central tenant, then we need to be mindful of, I guess, limitations within that against the integrations and the features that can be enabled. 
And then there's also, I guess, for, for the own tenant, it can provide all that, that full integration piece, full services that are needed and go into that critical voice and contact centre environment. Um, so there's different use cases. I think for, for it's obviously Cisco and there's different use cases for Microsoft. And the key part is, is that, uh, I guess, fundamentally, we've, we've done a lot of work within Block to understand the, the, the two core components, how them to integrate and the services that each can provide. I mean, whether we're talking about, obviously, that voice environment, whether we're talking about the video and the desktop collaboration suite, then really we're opened up now to it's a client of choice. And as part of that choice, then there needs to be consideration into them uh, investments investments within the, the Cisco collaboration technology stack and the investment into the Microsoft uh, N365 license and agreement. And like I say, that investment comes in two parts. You've got the, the central tenant and the own tenant. And really what, what we can work through trust with is to understand how, how them two services work within the different tenants and how that then can integrate into the, uh, into the collaboration stack um, for the voice and, and contact center services and the video rooms. I think that's, that's, that's more or less what I wanted to go through, obviously, to go through the actual user experience and the details and then integrations, I'm going to hand over to, to Rodri. Thank you, Sean. Um, you've got my Oops. slide. Sorry, skipped all the way. <laughs> oh, okay. I there we go. We go. Ready. Okay. So, yeah. My name is Rodri Griffiths. I, I've worked for Cisco in the healthcare team for about 13 years now, so I'm, I'm quite familiar with the demanding environment you, know, you live and operate in. So, yeah, what we just discussed today is some of the Cisco much of interoperability we've developed over the last, in reality, sort of 10 years, but specifically how that's changing now as Microsoft Teams is coming more and more to the fore inside healthcare. If you look at the slide here, you'll see from the left-hand side, that's the Microsoft world. And this is the bit we've integrated with for a number of years, to be honest, inside Cisco. So, you know, you want to work in Outlook, but you want to take advantage of, of the Cisco calling. How do we do that? You know, there's always been things that click the dial inside the productivity suite in, in Microsoft that you could have actually done to make it easier for you to actually use the, the underlying Cisco communication application without having to jump out of the tools you want to use day to day. And there's numerous examples of that. If you wanted to look at WebEx, and Sean discussed WebEx earlier on, sort of um, scheduling Microsoft uh, WebEx in Outlook is very easy. We've done a lot of investment to make that easy so you could actually schedule your WebEx meetings inside the tools you want to use. Sure. But what we're seeing now is more and more people adopting Microsoft Teams in there. The question now is different. Not only do we now want to actually use potentially Cisco real-time elements, so meeting or calling inside Microsoft uh, sort of applications, but also you might want to mix some Microsoft applications, you've got some applications, and some Cisco you've got some applications. I went getting quite a lot of pressure on this a number of years ago. So effectively, people were talking about, well, you know, I've invested quite a lot in Microsoft, I've invested quite a lot in Cisco. How do I make this work better? And about 12 months ago now, Cisco and Microsoft uh, did a, a, a public statement saying, we're going to look at how we work better together effectively. So how do we actually combine the standards-based Cisco view of real-time communication and bring into that Microsoft so we don't have two islands effectively? So that's where we are now. So inevitably, there's quite a lot of different flavors of this depending on, on what your circumstance, but, but that's what we hope to cover in the next sort of 10, 15 minutes, cover some of the basics of those that we are doing today. If we go to the next slide, So we still see quite people use, as Sean said, WebEx meetings. And for specific things like MDT rooms, there's a number of advantages for going down that path for yourselves. It is very standards based. We've got very flexible layouts in how we do it. We're beginning to look at bringing in sort of AI assistance into it. In terms of the COVID world, the ability to actually start that meeting without physically touching anything is quite valuable as well. So it's quite a lot of things that, are doing, that we're doing inside the WebEx cloud to actually make that valuable going forward. So we're still seeing that as a, as a big growth area for Cisco. And in fact, 
you could always have joined a WebS meeting. It was in Microsoft clients. So you could have actually used um, link to join a, a WebS meeting. And, and that was a, a valid client and it's been a, a sort of a built in integration for a number of years. As part of the memorandum of understanding, there is some work being done by Microsoft to allow Microsoft room systems to join WebEx meetings. So that, that's an ongoing piece of work that's, that we're doing with them at the moment in terms of looking at that and how they can allow that. But that's one sort of integration, if you like. So we go over to the next slide. So what you're probably more thinking about when we talk about integration is you're there, you're, you're using Microsoft Teams as your day-to-day -day application. How can I make adva take advantage of that Cisco desk phone you know, at the same time? So what we've done is we've done some integrations now that are, allow calling to be done natively from Microsoft Teams, and it will either do a, a click to dial, a CTI type of call to your desk phone that's already in place, or it will actually act like a soft phone and you have a video call on there. So why do we think that's valuable? It means that your investment in Cisco, you can still take advantage of. So any integrations you've got on that, and, and Sean mentioned the sort of, you know, contact center, red phones, all those sort of things, you sort of advantage of those, even if I'm physically sitting on a Microsoft Teams client. So what we're doing is actually making that Teams client just act like a Cisco phone, act like a standards-based phone and build into your existing well-established call manager or, or, or WebEx calling system. So if you go on to the next slide, how do I as a user see that? What I can do is we can enter into the, we can integrate the soft phone into the client. So effectively, as you see on the on the right uh, left hand side there, you've got that new icon at the bottom. If I click on that icon, effectively what happens is I will start a standard Cisco based call from that client. So for the user, I'm I'm in, I'm in a, an existing conversation in this case with, with Charles Holland. After my first three or four chats, I've decided, hey, it's going to be easier if we have a call rather than actually send text for the next five minutes. Tell you what, what's the easier way of making that call? I just click on that icon. The system will automatically grab his number and make a call direct to Charles on, on your behalf. And as I said previously, that can either be on your desk phone automatically or as a soft phone from the client itself. It's a very easy way of elevating a call. And even if you're in Teams and you want to look back and actually say, and actually say, I want to make a, a, a call from there, but I'm not in an interesting conversation, I can bring up the keypad, you know, dial the number if I want to, or more likely look at my contacts and say, right, I want to talk to Mary, put Mary's details in, and it will bring up Mary's number and actually elevate that call for you automatically. It's quite a nice way of allowing your users to live in that Microsoft Teams world, but still take advantage of all the features you've got in the underlying Cisco calling infrastructure. Thank you. Now, also for, for a number of, of months now, we've had integrations of WebEx, WebEx meetings into uh, Microsoft Teams. You actually install, you, you effectively import an app into it. It's on the Microsoft App Store. You bring it into it. And then when I want to have a meeting, I can start that meeting. I can schedule that meeting. I can do everything I want from that WebEx meeting you're familiar with from inside Teams. So as it says there, I can, I can start my personal room or I can schedule a, a call in the future. It will do all of that for me without having to physically leave Microsoft Teams. So it's all about trying to make that as easy as, as possible for you to take advantage of your existing investments in whatever conference platform you've got and bring that into the day-to-day -day work that you've got inside Teams. Thank you. So that's fine. We've still got people now going to look at bring it, looking at Microsoft for the actual video conferencing themselves. So now I've got a, a Microsoft um, bridge. 
can I bring my existing room systems into that bridge? Well, by default, no, you can't because the Microsoft system is not designed to work with you know, a, a typical non-Microsoft uh, room system. But if I've got those, how do I bring it in? So we've got two options we've just launched. The first one is the CVI Cloud Gateway. So that's the richer of the two. That, that, what that's designed to do, we've actually spun up a tenant inside Azure so we can actually bring in our WebEx rooms into that and then interoperate then into the Microsoft Teams meeting. So I can now bring in you know, Cisco or any, in, in truth, any standards-based room system into your existing uh, Microsoft uh, meetings. The one underneath, the one at the bottom, is a more basic integration. But what I'm doing here is I'm using our latest generation room systems and it does a web RTC call direct into the Microsoft meetings. So it's not as rich as the one above, but it also requires less integration. So it's an easy one to join. If let's say somebody in another tenant said, I'm gonna start a Microsoft meeting now, and you happen to be sitting in front of a room system, how do I join that? Do I forget about the room system and actually open my Teams client and use my Teams client? Or can I take advantage of that proper video system in that room? And that's precisely what this second option allows me to do. I can actually join any Microsoft meeting from the current generation of Cisco room systems effectively. If you come to the next slide, it goes in a bit more detail about the two differences. So if I look at the Cisco video gateway, the CVI, that's about you as an organization saying, I'm going to use Microsoft for lots of my meetings now. I'm going to use that as my bridge. But how can I bring in all my traditional room systems and bring those into that meeting? So I make that investment and by doing that, I can bring those into that common meeting because the worst thing you can ever do is to give users a choice of two or three different ways of joining a meeting. You, you want to have one common meeting because that reduces, it, it'll increase adoption and reduce com its complexity. So, okay, I'm going to use Microsoft as my main meeting. I can now actually bring all my video units into that if I want to as well. We have done some work on this. So it's actually some of the, the value add has, has been added. So for example, you've got you know, attendee list or roster list that we call it inside those video systems if I want. So I can have a list of who's in there. It's designed in such a way that if I've got a, a two room system, a, a two display system, I can make take best advantage of that one. I can have the video on one, and if I'm sharing content, it'll be shared on the second. Or if I've got no content shared, I can have the main speaker on one and the rest of the users on the other. So it's designed to take best advantage of that system as far as I can. And as I said before, that does support all Cisco SIP enabled video endpoints, but all the others as well. And it's very easy to join. So if I do calendar integration, it can be as simple as the, as the big green button you're used to in WebEx, the, the one button to push, or I can dial into a bridge number, or I can use the IVR platform. So it's very easy to do that. That is a, a licensed solution, effectively. Inside the Web RTC, the main use case here is I want to quickly on the fly join somebody else's um, WebEx uh, sorry, somebody else's Microsoft meetings. Now, I may not know, they may have CVI installed, they may not, I don't know. But can I actually join that meeting anywhere? Absolutely, you can. On the latest range of, of devices, so that the, the current range of, of room kits, room series, desk pros, we, we, have, we have embedded a browser in that, and that can be used to join the Microsoft team directly. And when I do that, I do get that green one button to push sort of experience. Thank you. In terms of that CVI, as I said, there's a few things in there that we've done to actually give the best ex possible experience on there. So as I mentioned before, we have got multi-screen support on there, so it will make use of a, 
a sensible use of a room system or, or two two systems and make a, a, a sensible use of that one. You can modify that layout if I want. I can have it, yeah, there will be an attendee list. So there's a few things in there that are designed to actually make that work as simply as possible. Next one. And there's a slide after this one, I hope. So what we have seen is more and more people use Teams now because of the investment the NHS has made into that platform. We are going to see more and more people inside the health service living and breathing Teams. And what we've done is to look at how can I actually make it easy for those users to actually use that, but still take advantage of the underlying real-time sort of audio video infrastructure they've invested in with, with, with Cisco. So that CVI gateway and the web RTC interop is the primary way of doing that. How can I do that? But also to actually embed Cisco voice calling in that if it needs to be as well, to actually allow that click the dial to make it simpler. So whatever users are doing inside Microsoft Teams, they will access to those, you know, the, the underlying Cisco real-time elements. And I think that's all I had to cover. Thank you. That's great, Roger. Many, many thanks for that. And Sean, thanks for your presentation too. Um, we'll now take some questions. Just to remind people, if you have any questions, um, you have the ability to type those in. I think it's on the, the side, on the right-hand side. So please uh, feel free to type away. We've got one question coming so far. We've got a number of questions uh, as we kind of put this as a, the first kind of topic out there that we've come in by email, which we can cover as well. Um, Sean, Roger, I'll ask the question. Please feel free to, to metaphorically put your hand up if uh, you feel it's more your, your area. So first question is from Darren. Thanks for, for, for that, Darren. It's, hi, does the collaboration between Teams and Cisco provide a dial-in number for people that are outside of your organization for Teams meetings in the same way that you can in WebEx? Do you want me to cover that, Rodri? Yeah, go on. Okay, no worries. Yeah, so I mean, really, the, the dialing functionality comes from the, uh, the the bridge itself. So obviously, if you're if you're hosting a Microsoft meeting, then the, the dialing functionality would come from that, and that can be enabled within Microsoft. Uh, if you're hosting a Cisco meeting, then the dialing functionality would, would come from the Cisco WebEx side of things. In terms of the integration, and correct me if I'm wrong, Rodri, it doesn't provide dialing functionality to the meeting is it's more around that standards based integration for SIP um, and, and sort of H3, I guess, integration of the, the video units rather than PSTN. Absolutely correct. We're not allowed to do that but by, by the rules of the, what we signed with Microsoft, apparently. So, yeah, it, it is the 323 and SIP video that we actually integrate with, not um, audio. So, I guess, in, in summary, the uh, the, the, the dialing the PSTN dialing functionality comes from the bridge itself. So whether that's Microsoft that you're using as a bridge or whether that's Cisco using as the bridge. Great. Thanks, guys. Darren, I hope that uh, that answers the question for you. Um, I'll move on until we get some, some more questions through to ones that we had uh, before uh, before from some of the customers. So for, first one, guys, is if we have legacy video devices such as Tanberg, can these be used to join a Microsoft meeting? Yeah, so I think as, as, as Roger said before, it's, um, it's the, the, the Cisco Cloud Video Interop provides a functionality for any any video device, whether it's I guess whether it's a legacy unit um, on on Tamburg or Cisco, or whether it's a, a I guess any other SIP standard um, video device so that could be Poly or uh, or others. Yes, yeah, so that's the question then is if it's very old and only uses 323 you'd have to actually change that to sip but yes absolutely the cvi integration is designed to take any standards based video and bring that into that microsoft world for you the web rtc version no that would not be supported so it, it would be that cvi integration that would provide that service Okay, thanks, guys. Uh, next question, we have one in from Daryl. Uh, <clears throat> he says, appreciate this, uh, the topic of this webinar is Microsoft and Cisco integration. And this might be a, a little left field, guys, but, um, but I wonder where customers are using Zoom meetings. Is the functionality integration between Cisco and Zoom similar? Are we able to, to answer that? 
trying to pick that one, Rodrigo? <clears throat> that much at the moment with Zoom, surprise, surprise. Um, we have done, well, the investment we've done recently in integration has been focused around you know, the Microsoft. No doubt there will be some things happening with Zoom, but there's nothing much being pushed at, the, at this stage, to be fair. Okay, thank you. Um, another question, uh, if we have ISDN connectivity, does it limit the integration we can do with Microsoft? No, so I guess fundamentally where we're talking about the uh, the integration of the calling platforms, uh, which we're talking about with the ISN connectivity, is is really um, you you can still integrate between uh, like the Cisco WebEx and Java clients and the Microsoft Teams clients. I think where um, if if you're wanting to, I guess uh, what we've not touched too much on is, is direct routing, but if you wanted to put use a Cisco Cube Gateway for direct routing, then you would you would need to look at I guess the, the SIP integration there rather than it being ISDN. But there's the, I guess there's diff, different ways of doing that integration, and uh, we can work through that with people that are on uh, ISDN and, and what the requirements are. Great. Thank you. Uh, next next question that's come in um, from a security point of view. Are there security considerations we need to consider when using Microsoft and Cisco collaboration? So I guess a more of a generic question, but Yeah, absolutely. I think with, with any I guess with any collaboration technology, there's security considerations that, that need to be made. I mean in, in terms of that integration, then uh, the, 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 the CVI sort of takes that into consideration. But with, with both Microsoft Teams and with the Cisco WebEx platform, then we can we can work with customers to talk about them. I guess some specific settings that are needed to make sure that actually that meeting service is secure, um, and any of the voice elements are are secured as needed. Um, I think I guess where where we do talk about SIP um, and 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 any voice connectivity, then like you wouldn't want to release that and just have a SIP over the internet link that, that that's not encrypted. But but fundamentally, yes, there are security requirements and. Obviously, there's detail that we can go through in terms of that for both platforms. Okay, thanks, Sean. Uh, a question which I, I imagine will be uh, on many people's list, lists with uh, with a mixed economy that, that there is in with most trusts. So, can we use a combination of Cisco and Microsoft video devices in the meetings? Yeah, yeah. I think obviously, uh, Rodri touched on it in, in the slides and the fact that we, if if you've got a, a Cisco uh, room or Microsoft room, either can join. Uh, the, the different platforms, and then obviously Microsoft are developing their services to join a WebEx meeting. But, but fundamentally, we'll work with customers, understand the requirements, and 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 provide recommendations on the video devices accordingly. Okay, thank you, Sean. There's a, there's a couple more. As I said before, if you have any more, please do uh, take the opportunity to to type them into us now, and we'll we'll get them answered. Uh, next one on the list was: um, Will these services work within a virtual desktop environment? Yeah, so I think I guess uh, Rodri, if you've got anything to add on this, but I guess fundamentally, any any virtual desktop environment, then the uh, where we talk about the Cisco world and the, the the collaboration services are I guess optimized to work within them environments. There's there's certain prerequisites that we can work through with people. So we've got our our workspace team that are developed in the the Azure virtual desktop, but fundamentally, we can talk through I guess then Cisco requirements all the Microsoft Teams requirements to make sure that media is optimised uh, and, and routes the best possible way. Um, and there's been a number of challenges where people sort of see that degradation of, of audio and video quality and that user experience suffer when you go into a virtualised environment. And that's that's something that we've been working, I guess, the, a, a key requirement of this, and especially around COVID-19, is that the collaboration services are portable alongside the, the desktop environments. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, we've got one here uh, from Justin. Uh, will the CDI cloud replace the TMS? No. So I guess fundamentally there's, and again, Roger, I, I won't take all of it if you want to add anything on, but I think there's, um, I guess there's, 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 there's multiple parts to that and there's uh, where you look at them on-premise video environments and TMS and Cisco meeting managers. I guess fundamentally what, what that can provide for a lot of trusts is that real sort of MDT white glove environment of a meeting service. So there's, there's, there's still a place for them services and there's still a place where we talk about the different connect connectivity models and whether you, whether you want to consume the video service over public internet or whether you need to communicate over HSCN. 
And I think the, the on-premise environment still has some key functionality when people talk through that um, that MDT scenario where um, you, you necessarily wouldn't want the clinicians and the consultants in the room to be handling the call, but you want to be able to have that sort of, like I say, wide club meeting service. So there's, there's certainly common points in it, but there's certainly requirements on either side that are still still beneficial to, to having the TMS and the Cisco meeting manager. Great, thank you. A, a follow-on from there's quite a lot of different, Sorry. Okay. No, there's quite a lot of different aspects to look at, the, at how you want to use your video, and that's where I think getting experienced partners like Block involved is quite critical because there's lots of ways you can plug all this thing together to get different outcomes effectively. So to me, it is very much a case of what you're trying to achieve, how how critical is it? Can I depend on a cloud infrastructure or do I must have something on-premise or, or on-premise fallback and work with a credible partner to actually craft that solution to the exact requirements? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, a follow on from Justin, which we'll, we'll do first as it kind of follows on from the, the question that, that Sean just answered. Uh, will CVI work with Starleaf? Um, probably have to take it away and just fully understand it. I guess, are we talking, uh, it's probably a question back really, so we, we may want to take it away, but are we talking about Starleaf as being the, the bridge? or sort of endpoints that you would normally use and are registered to Starleaf. Now, I guess my understanding of them, if I take it into two different parts, is that if you've got the, the endpoints which are SIP-based and maybe using Starleaf as a registration, then yes, obviously CVI, and we've sort of mentioned about the, I guess that them standards-based video units can connect through and connect onto that CVI. So as long as there's no restrictions on the Starleaf side, then uh, as long as there is, as long as a SIP communication is sent to CVI, then it, it, it can be utilised. I guess if we're talking about integration to the Starleaf uh, video platform, then yeah, it probably depends what what actually is wanted to be achieved from that, and to be able to comment in full. Sure. And that's great. And, and Justin, I think as, as Sean obviously says, we'll give our details out afterwards. Please feel free to, to contact us, obviously specifically Sean, and I'm sure I'd be happy to have a conversation with you in, in more detail uh, about it. Uh, we've got a couple more come in. Uh, so one from Mark. Uh, I, thanks, Mark. I work from Shef uh, for Sheffield Teaching Hospitals, and we've just purchased uh, on-premise Cisco infrastructure. Will there be an ad added cost to add this integration? Uh, when will this integration be available? No, it's one for you, Rodri, or? So, as we depend on what integration we're talking about, in terms of the video, if they're looking at CVI, there is a, a license fee for that as such. Um, partly because Cisco has to pay Microsoft to actually enable that integration. But it depends on what you're trying to achieve and actually what integration you're talking about. So, if you're talking about the audio integration, the audio video into the client itself, then there's, you're probably covered already, is my first guess, because you're using a soft phone, and if you're using a license for the soft phone, there's nothing else to add to it on, on the Cisco side. So it will be a look at exactly which features you want to turn on and off to actually say, okay, is that included or not? Great. I, yeah, I just re, I guess I, I assume, obviously, uh, we work with Sheffield a lot over the past uh, uh, 12 to 18 months and I guess the, the question is probably pertinent around the CVI interop and obviously yeah like I say Rodri there's that there's that charge for the CVI license uh, and we can work with, with, with Sheffield on getting them devices on boarded um, as needed to, to be able to use that functionality. Great thanks guys and I guess Mark same as with Justin please uh, feel free to reach out to us and we can Kind of continue that conversation in in more detail. Um, Daryl, another question from you. Thank you. Uh, could you uh, recap what licenses are needed from Microsoft as a prereq for this work for this to work? One of you over to. Yeah, I guess add in Roger where where you, you feel needed, but fundamentally from a from a Microsoft point of view, it depends on the integration methods that are going to be used. So if we talk about the the WebEx calling or or, um, or Java application being used um, and embedded into the Microsoft Teams client, then fundamentally there's there's, there's no real licensing requirements to do that as, as a cross launch. Obviously, for, from a CVI point of view, then the, the licensing is on the the, the Cisco um, element for the, the cloud video interop. If we're talking about direct routing um, and, and pushing calls from Cisco uh, Cube Gateway. 
into, into Microsoft Teams uh, as that sort of direct connection, then you'd need to enable the Microsoft Teams uh, phone system license, uh, which, which is uh, additional to what's given in N365 uh, licensing. But again, um, so the different license models, there's different ways of integrating. I think it depends on the requirements, really depends on what the answer would be to that. Um, so really work with the with, with yourselves and just go through what, what, what that would mean in terms of the integration point and what that licensing requirement would be. Um, but certainly, if, like I say, the, the only real one from a Microsoft side of things that you would need to, to be considering is a phone system license if you did want to consume phone services from natively within Microsoft. That's great, thank you, Sean. Uh, we've got one final question, which I guess uh, is linked slightly into the, the quality question in terms of VDI that you answered before, Sean, but maybe more of a broader one. Uh, we have uh, quality issues in our collaboration services. How do you prevent this uh, and ensure a consistent quality of service? Yeah, so I guess it, it depends where the, the quality issues come from as well. So I guess fundamentally when did we, did we say it's a virtual desktop environment? Sorry, no, no, just in general. I was saying you obviously talked slightly around the VDI, but yeah. a slight solution to that. Yeah, so I think really when we talk about quality issues, then uh, fundamentally what, what we do when we work with customers is actually start to understand, uh, I guess, the network. As part of onboarding of any cloud service, it's kind of that, that, that natural check that we want to do to make sure that actually, one, all, all the, the firewall ports, et cetera, are open, to the, the bandwidth and the requirements are all considered and understood from, from a customer point of view. And then three, I guess, we, we then make sure that the required testing is done before we kind of go in and implement the system. So there's there's there's, there's key services which, which Cisco have released, which is great. So they, they provide like web URLs to test the media connection. Fundamentally, the, videos, the video connectivity could work and you kind of think, okay, I've got a connection. But it, it, it may be running on like say um, TCP rather than UDP, and as if if there is a degradation of quality of the network service, then obviously with TCP you get a number of retransmits, and there's just a number of considerations to be made. I think mean, then like with anything, then considerations should be made prior to implementation rather than following on from it, so that when it when it does get implemented and rolled out to the end users, you then don't start to face them degradation issues, them degradation of quality. And obviously, it just it just pushes back what you would what you'd expect from a natural adoption curve, because people resist that change. So. That's great. Thank you, Sean. Um, we're pretty much at the at the end of the hour. So f first off, thank you to to Rodri and Sean for your presentations and for very uh, very detailed and and articulate answers to to those questions. Uh, thank you to all of you for joining. We we really appreciate it. I think we've had about sort of 30, 35 people on the call. So it's great to to see the interest and hopefully you've. Number one, found it interesting and taking some some pieces of thought away. Um, clearly, you have account directors with blocks, so please feel free to reach out to them if you've got specific questions. But equally, after this, we'll um, we'll send the three of our de details out to you. Uh, if you want to reach out to us in terms of email or phone, we'd be very happy to take your call as well. So thank you, thank you very much.